All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson. I'm your host. In this episode, we are talking about Jonathan Haidt, the Tower of Babel, and the Book of Mormon. I have mentioned this before, but Jonathan Haidt, the social psychologist, is who got me involved in really studying critical social justice and, and some of the things that have been happening on campus. In 2012, I read one of his books that came out then called The Righteous Mind. And it was The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. It was fascinating. But he started to move more and more into the idea of what was happening on campus because he saw this happening on his own campus. And what was going on with the students? Something was different. It started to turn around 2011, 2012, three, four years after the iPhone came out. And so he's become kind of this expert on social media and its effects on especially the younger generation, from millennials down to now Generation Z. In 2018, he wrote a fabulous book that's called The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. And this is very true. This is not a guy who's a conservative. He's leaned left his entire life. He comes out of academia, but he sees what's going on. He's also one of the founders of uh, an organization called uh, Heterodox Academy, which is more about we need diversification of ideas in the universities, what we used to have, but which has now been completely taken over by the religion of academia, critical social justice. So... He wrote an article last week that kind of summed up a number of things that he's been finding out and that are part of what he writes in his books. He wrote this in The Atlantic, and the title of the article is Why the Past Ten Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. (laughs) And so that would take us again back to that 2012 area right there, four years after the iPhone came out. And the first time that you had high school kids that had pretty much completely gone through with an iPhone in their hand for four years in high school, right? I had, had a smartphone for four years in high school and then arrived on campus. And there was a definite turn in things, even, even the year before 2011, which he covers. So I want to go through and just put some commentary on this article that he writes. He bases the article off of the idea of interestingly, because he's not religious, uh, off of the idea of the Tower of Babel. And so here's what I want to do. I want to go back to where the Tower of Babel is referenced in Genesis. And then I want to go to the toward the end of the Book of Mormon. And then we're going to go through and take a look at this article and, and dissect it a little bit. So here in Genesis 11, we get the story of, of of the Tower of Babel. And it's very short, and I've gone over this before. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on this. Very short, but very packed with ideas, philosophy, truths. It's, 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 It's a wonderful read if you really dig into it. But here in verse one, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Okay. And then down a little further, they said to one another in the Valley of Shinar, where they are, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And then they're going to build this tower, right? Let us build us a city and a tower. People forget about the city. The reason I bring that up is because I'm going to show you, I'm going to contrast this with something in a minute. Let us build, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So the interesting thing here to, to consider is that it, using this metaphor for this article, right, is you have the idea that these, this people are bigger and better than God. They're going to build their own tower that is going to rise up to heaven. They're going to build their own name, which I think if you really look at that, it's, it's, it's not the name of God. It's not the name of Jehovah. It's not the name of Jesus Christ. They're going to build their own name, their own unification. And they feel that if they build this tower up to heaven, that that's going to help them rise up. That's the idea of the the story here. 
By the way, um, and if you follow the podcast, you hear me make this parallel all the time, the Tower of Babel is the same as the great and spacious building of Lehi's dream. It's the same thing. It's pride. That's the point here. It is pride. And it's going to have a great fall. And it's going to, what happens here with the Tower of Babel? They're going to be divided. That's where we get the, the, the people of Jared, right? The Jaredites coming out from this, this group here. So the Lord comes down and he sees the city and the tower, which, which the children of men had built, right? And the Lord says, look, the people is one. One in what? Not in Zion, right? Not pure in heart. They're one in this idea of building up this, this thing up to heaven for themselves. They're one in pride. They all have one language, right? Nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. So uh, <laughs> I don't know that he's making this direct connection here, uh, Jonathan Hyde in his article, but we can imagine this as being social media and, and even broader the internet as a Tower of Babel. Look at all of the information that we have. Look at, look at, you know, we have access to everything. We are higher and better than all people before us. They didn't have this kind of knowledge at, the, at their fingertips. And by the way, because of this knowledge that I've gained, is God really as important to me, right? Or the church or the gospel? Because look, all this information here that I have, I can lower the gospel somewhat. In fact, I can critique it with all of this knowledge and information and lower it as I build up myself and the Tower of Babel with my knowledge and information that I get every single day on my smartphone. So that's how I would look at that, right? The Tower of Babel is kind of being built up here as, as the internet or, or as social media and a smartphone. So the Lord says, go to, let us go down, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. This is where Jonathan Haidt really comes in. He's more about the aftermath of the Tower of Babel here. That's really what he starts to talk about, where, where we see here in verse 9, um, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and he scatters everyone. And so his point is, is that social media especially has divided us and scattered us out with our own little groups and our own little languages. I mean, look at critical social justice. That's exactly what it does, is it has its own language. And then those on the right have their own language. And we're getting further and further into these pockets and these subgroups within those areas where, uh, you know, again, you kind of build these hydras uh, with uh, several different heads and several different, several different languages. And, 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 and it's not just the words, it's not just the vocabulary, but, but it's what you talk about. It's the issues that are important to you, right? It's, you, that's the breaking up of these things. There's less and less that seems to unite us, that gives us one name, especially, I'll say, in the United States. Right? There's less and less that gives us one name. And this rising of the Tower of Babel through knowledge on the internet, I think it also lowers to some degree our trust in institutions. What, look at what is happening. This is both on the left and on the right. Our, 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 our faith, our, you know, our trust in the institutions, whether, whether it's uh, education, whether it's um, um, medicine, whether it's government, whether it's, you know, whatever, you know, uh, the legal field, everything. Business, big business, right? Everything, we, we are, there is a larger and larger gap between these institutions and the people. And our trust in them is decreasing rapidly. So let me go into this article here a bit and bring up the points uh, that I've highlighted in his, in his article. He says, the story of Babel is the best metaphor I have found for what happened to America in the 2010s and for the fractured country that we now inhabit. Something went terribly wrong. So he is looking at this like, look, I mean, especially, you know, social media and the internet, this is not all good. 
This is this has really created a problem. Something really wrong. And he says it happens very suddenly. We are disoriented, unable to speak the same language or recognize the same truth. We are cut off from one another and from the past. This is also an infusion. He doesn't bring this up as much, but it's the infusion of these new philosophies. You know, postmodernism is everybody expresses their own truth. Everybody has their own experiential truth. That's starting to fall apart. So even science is being attacked. He says... Babel is not a story about tribalism. He goes beyond that. He says it's a story about the fragmentation of everything. Everything being fragmented and then fragmented further and then more and more. It's disintegration. He says it's about the shattering of all that had seemed solid. The, only, the scattering of people who had been a community. It's a metaphor for what is happening not only between red and blue, you know, left and right, but within the left and within the right, as well as within universities, companies, professional associations, museums, and even families. And this is part of why I think there's even more juice put into this lack of, you know, this lack of trust. He says, in the first decade of the new century, social media was widely believed to be a boon to democracy. It's very interesting, isn't it? Again, it's it's these Pandora boxes that we open up and then we can't control. So we look further and further to rules and regulation and force coercion. What dictator, he says, could impose his will on an interconnected citizenry? What regime could build a wall to keep out the internet? Well, especially when you have deals with Apple and Google, etc., it's not too tough. This is in the year 2011, he says. He really hones in on 2011 and and, and 2012. But he says in 2011, this is when the Arab Spring happened. And so everyone was thinking, wow, you know, remember that social media was was coming in and and, and it was going to free everybody uh, because they could organize and mobilize. And it's not really what happened, is it? It had its effect. And then, boom, tyranny came in and tightened down the screws. After that is all that happened. That's not what everybody thought at the time. He also says that in 2011, this is when Google Translate, Google Translate became available on virtually all smartphones. So you could say that, now that's not as big of a deal for us in the U.S. where we have English, but when you have all of the media and all the information, especially coming out from English producing, producing websites, that was a big thing for most of the world to get access to that information when Google Translate came out. Because then that could all be translated into their own language. They could read from the Atlantic. They could read from uh, you know CNN, Fox News, whatever it is. They're able to read everything that's coming out in English. And so he says, look, this is kind of like the idea of, of being one people, building the Tower of Babel. He gets the metaphor wrong here, I, I think. But... So it's kind of like, you know, we can, we can all we're, 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 translate, we're all reading the same things, we all become kind of one people, but that's not a, what happened at all. The exact opposite thing happened. Now, in February of 2012, this is interesting, as he prepared to take Facebook public, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg reflected on those extraordinary times and set forth his plans. He said... I quote, today our society has reached another tipping point. (laughs) This is 10 years ago. He wrote this in the letter to investors in Facebook. He says, we hope to rewire the way people spread and consume information. What does he do with it? What, What happens here in 2012? They were given the power to share. Literally, the power to share news stories, posts, etc. That's what it is. It would help them to enhance, once again, transform many of our core institutions and industries. Uh, this is where we get another big bump in, 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 in change on, on what happens here. When we get the, when we get the, uh, the share button, from uh, from Facebook. 
And, and of course, as he mentions here, nothing has worked out the way he expected 10 years ago. And, and, and we think about all these changes that we want today in society, breaking down the nuclear family, changing uh, um, laws and policies and procedures and, and certain norms. Yes, they're, they're hegemonic norms, call them. That doesn't mean they're bad. But we want to, you know, these societal norms, everybody's, you know, they're, the critiquing, the breaking down, the deconstruction of all of these things, you don't know what is going to replace that. You just don't know. It's the same thing here with social media. It's not necessarily going to be good. You're not necessarily moving toward a utopia. He brings up a some studies that have been done by social scientists, and they've identified three major forces that uh, collectively will bind together a successful democracy, right? Democracies have got to run off of certain things. There has to be a certain willingness of the people, the majority of the people. There's going to be a tipping point there somewhere for everybody to participate in a democracy. First one is social capital, right? So you have extensive social networks with high levels of trust, Strong institutions, number two, you have to have strong institutions and the trust in those institutions. And so that's something that America did very, very well as it built up in its democracy, in its relationship with the government and the institutions, the spread of, of the enlightenment and, and principles and science and went out with these companies. They developed this through science and the technology. Um, everything, right, was, was really done very, very well in, in separating church, state, and business, right? Instead of having them all centered in government, in the state. The third one, and this is, this is a problem, the third one is shared stories, our narrative. That has changed completely. Even when I was a kid, the same stories were, were brought up when I was young, that, that my parents were read when they were young, and that their parents were read, and so on and so forth, right? It, it's, there's, there's a similar narrative and a similar story that builds culture. And what he says is that social media has weakened all three of these things. He talks about how early on social media was a place where you could connect with people. And that's originally the idea, you know, of when you had like MySpace and then early on in Facebook and you would put up things about your family and where you've gone. And of course, that still happens for some people. They still use it that way. But over time, as he says here, people became more adept at putting on performances. Boy, you see that. And managing their personal brand. I think that is very insightful and a very good articulation of what has happened a lot on social media. You are putting out a personal brand for your personal life. And, and, and uh, it, it, you know, in some cases for me, it's very odd. You, you, many people are putting out their entire, it's like their life is being performed online for people. It's like they're creating their own reality show. He says, activities that might impress others but that do not deepen friendships in the way that a private phone conversation will, right, have been put up. And, and that's a lot of what's, what's, what's happening on social media. And he says this has a lot to do with the development of the algorithms and the technology on the back end of the, of the social media platforms. He says, once social media platforms had trained users to spend more time performing and less time connecting. The stage was set for the major transformation, which began in 2009, the intensification of viral dynamics. And, and how does that happen? Well, back in 2009. 2009 is when Facebook offered the like button, right? That, we think about those as being such simple things. But the like button, it, it, we see that. It, that means that there is some social capital behind a post. And it also means that the algorithm boosts the post even more and, and gets it out in front of more and more people. 
And so that allowed for virality, uh, uh, if that's the right word, right, or the intensification of viral dynamics, as, as Jonathan Haidt says. And then in the same year in 2009, that's when Twitter offered the retweet button. So now you were not just connected with the people that followed you, but those that followed you or saw your post could retweet to their followers. And that created uh, viral activity as well. Of course, again, Facebook comes back and hits the share button in 2012. And we're off to the races. And he brings this up as well, which, you know, we, we really need to understand how these social media platforms are operating and, and how they, they manipulate us. And, and if we're not keeping an arm's length relationship with our social platform, we're going to fall right into the traps that they're setting. And they are setting traps. He says, shortly after the like button began to produce data about what best engaged its users, Facebook developed algorithms to bring each user the content most likely to generate a like or some other interaction, eventually including the share as well. Later research showed that posts that trigger emotions, especially anger at an out group, are the most likely to be shared. And of course, that's human psychology. And, and, and it's just playing to the worst part of human nature. We see that also in political campaigns. Most political campaigns now focus 90% on demonizing the other side, right? Ginning up the outrage against their opponents or, or the opposite party. This is what's most likely to work is playing to the lowest elements of our human nature. The only place you, you oftentimes will see what someone really stands for is if you maybe go to a website and see what they say about their issues in a campaign. If you're on video here, I'm showing a, a, an illustration here that's kind of interesting where you've got Facebook is kind of like on fire at the center here and people are, it's, a, it's an old painting and people are rushing toward it toward this burning Facebook icon. And um, that's kind of what's happening, right? He says here that, you know, 2008 was very different from by, you know, coming to 2013. He says, if you were skillful, skillful or lucky, you might create a post that would go viral and make you internet famous for a few days anyway. If you blundered, you could find yourself buried in hateful comments. This is really important because it changes the psychology of us on how we interact with others. We are much more distrustful. We are much more concerned about, well, is this going to be something that is liked that I say or not liked? And it's not just on social media. Social media is where we get this training. And if you have kids that have been going through this for years, especially when they're young, this is, this is exactly what is happening to their brains. You've got kids that have their own smartphones when they're young and they're worried about, is this going to be liked? Is it not liked? And then especially, is it really, are there comments that are really harsh against you? Right? You're going to learn real quick what you're supposed to say and what you're not supposed to say. And that's a real problem when the loudest voices online are the two extremes, 10% hard left, 10% hard right. They are the loudest and most extreme voices online. They have the, they are able to leverage social media more than any other group online. He says your posts can ride to fame or ignominy based on the clicks of thousands of strangers. And you in turn contributed thousands of clicks to the game. The new game encouraged dishonesty and mob dynamics. Users were guided not just by their true preference, but by their past experiences of reward and punishment and their prediction of how others would react to, new, to each new action. We are becoming performers. And again, these kids, I mean, you can imagine you put your kids on there constantly and taking pictures or video and everything else, if that's not just for family 
and it's going out to everyone and you're coming back and saying, hey, look how many likes this got. Well, your, your kid is learning and growing up, learning to perform for others. And, and they understand that what is rewarded and what is not rewarded might dictate their behavior and everybody else's behavior. This is not just for kids. This is for adults as well. Now, bringing it back to democracy, again, we think social media and the internet opening everything up is great for democracy. Well, that depends on how we're able to handle it. It's kind of like partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You've just opened up Pandora's box because people are all going to make different decisions. And not only are they, is everyone going to make different decisions, everybody's a part of all of those decisions. Everybody's a part of all of these other worlds that they've never been exposed to. All of these other ideas, all of these other languages, all of these other uh, harsh attitudes. Again, because they're the loudest voices. So he brings it back to Madison, uh, James Madison, in Federalist Paper Number 10. This is very interesting. He says, It was just the kind of twitchy and explosive spread of anger that James Madison had tried to protect us from as he was drafting the U.S. Constitution. The framers of the Constitution were excellent social psychologists. That's interesting. They knew that democracy had an Achilles heel because it depended on the collective judgment of the people, and democratic communities are subject to the turbulency and weakness of unruly passions. The key to designing a sustainable republic, therefore, was to build in mechanisms to slow things down. Cool passions require compromise and give leaders some insulation from the mania of the moment while still holding them accountable to the people periodically on election day. So he says, social media is now Madison's nightmare because of its openness. He says, the tech companies that enhanced virality in, from 2009 to 2012 brought us deep into Madison's nightmare, where, where uh, we talk about factioning off. It's going to be really easy to break into little factions. Look at Europe as a whole. That's, that's a very difficult thing to manage, always has been out there. We've done a pretty amazing job so far in the United States, I would say, overall. And again, you can look at it glass half empty or glass half full. I, I would say it's more than half full on that. But he says, uh, this is what uh, um, Madison says. He says that the people are much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. Right? There's, there's that tendency in each of us to um, focus on our own desires and our own needs. Right? Factionalism. He quotes Madison again and says, where no substantial occasion presents itself, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. And that's kind of where this is brought us to, right? This is, this is a factionalizing, a, a defragmenting, a deconstruction, a dis disintegration of society and unraveling of things that have has happened since the internet and then social media has become so dominant in our lives. Then he gets back to the trust, and I and I can't I can't say this enough. My my concern is it's not just democracy, and that's obviously a major issue, and and it's got to be. We do have an Achilles heel in, in democracy, and social media might be something that is going to, uh, you know, be able to shoot several arrows at that Achilles heel, where that, that armor is not covered, covering, uh, you know, our weakness there. But it's also the church. And, you know, I've noticed from both the left and the right, it used to be much more on the left, now it's building more and more on the right where there's more and more distrust in the brethren and in the institution of, of the church. And I'm not talking about the subgroups, the, the uh, subsidiaries of Deseret Book and uh, Deseret News and, and, and these things, right? That's, those are different animals to me. 
but in the church itself and in the brethren, there is a greater level of distrust than I have ever seen in my life overall. And that's very concerning. And, and, and I think it's also a part of this whole movement of social media. What, 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 is, what is rewarding my mind? What am I reading from others that are on, an, on the extremes? And then adopting a little bit or wondering about... And, and then, you know, things get retweeted, they get shared. I, I see it in front of my, my timeline. I read it. I have new ideas on something. And do I then start to adopt it? Um, boy, a lot of people have liked this post. Um, do I want to say something against it? I think trust is falling apart and disintegrating in all of our institutions, but it's also falling apart in, you know, or including with the church. I think that's concerning. And so he talks about the trust issue here again. He says that it's not just the waste of time and scarce attention that matters. It's the continual chipping away of trust. And autocracy, speaking of democracy here, can deploy propaganda or use fear to motivate the behaviors it desires. But a democracy depends widely on internalized acceptance of the legitimacy of rules, norms, and institutions. And when you combine social media with critical social justice that wants to break all of those things down, when they talk about systemic racism and changing the systems this is what they're talking about. People need to realize that. This is, this is a chipping away at everything. And many of us, whether we agree with critical social justice or not, go along with it. And, and that trust diminishes. And you cannot hold together a democracy without a trust in the institutions. Now, do the institutions merit that trust? Maybe not. But maybe some of it is being chipped away also from social media and, and, and what we see online and, and maybe how it's changing our behavior a little bit. He says the most recent Edelman Trust Barometer, that's an international measure of citizens' trust in government, business, media, and non-governmental organizations, it showed stable and competent autocracies like China and the United Arab Emirates at the top of the list, of course. And, and contentious democracies such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Spain, and South Korea scored near the bottom. Now, there's always been a healthy distrust in democracies, right? There needs to be. That's part of a democracy. You want that. You want the, you know, that goes along with having elected officials that know that they are accountable. But there's got to be a tipping point, I would think, where as that trust diminishes in all of those things in our society, that democracy no longer flourishes. And in fact, it is in trouble. And I think a big part of that is, is you know, bringing that to another level here is distrust in others. And, and, breaking apart, right? And this is where the Book of Mormon comes in. We'll come back to the article here in a minute, but we can see here the opposite in this time here in 4th Nephi of what's happening at the dispersion of at the Tower of Babel. Verse 3, 4th Nephi, and they had all things common among them, therefore they were not there were not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free. They were all made free. There's no coercion on this. That's very important to understand. This is all free choice, free will. And partakers, they were made partakers of the heavenly gift. Down a little bit lower here. Look, they, they did nothing except to work miracles, save it were in the name of Jesus. Remember the name that they wanted to make for themselves in building the Tower of Babel. Back here again, about the city and the Tower of Babel, right? Here you have... In verse 8, yea, even that great city, Zarahemla, did they cause to be built again. They built several cities. But this is a very different thing they're doing, right? They're doing it under the name of Jesus Christ. 
They're doing it under the doctrine of Christ here. And when this falls apart, it's going to be because of the doctrine of Christ. It's going to be because of Antichrist, people that, you know, when we think of the Antichrist as the evil person and all, that's not what it is in the Book of Mormon. The Antichrist or ant- people that are Antichrist are the dissenters from the Nephites. They don't believe in the doctrine of Christ. They don't believe there is a Son of God. That's what an Antichrist is, at least in the Book of Mormon. And of course, we get this uh, verse here in 17 that a lot of people like to quote now, and rightfully so. There were no robbers, no murderers, neither were there Lamanites, nor any matter of ites, but they were in one. So they're also in one, a different type of one for them, from the people of the Tower of Babel. The children of Christ and heirs to the kingdom of God because of their, their, their agency and what they did with it, right? And so this is where we are, we are breaking into ites at this point, and social media is accelerating this. And of course, and I'll be going over this soon because of uh, talking about a couple topics I'm, I'm going to be covering here, but of course, later in 4th Nephi, we see that eventually the same thing, right? It, it fragments just as what's happening now in our day and age. And um, there's good reasons for why it begins to fragment. And it's very similar to the Tower of Babel. Remember that the Tower of Babel and the Great and Spacious Building represent pride. They're building up, they're lifting yourself up or your group up above God in many ways, which is the first commandment. We just went over that in Exodus, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me, not even yourself. And if you look at Lehi's dream and understand that, what's happening there is you've got the Great and Spacious Building that is being lifted up and it's pride and what is the other side across the, the ravine there, across the chasm? What you have on the other side is the tree of life. And we need to look at that, I believe, as opposites. The tree of life is the opposite of pride. It is the doctrine of Christ. Condescension, right, below others, which means love. It's the love of Christ. So when I am lifted up and I puff myself up here, I'm over at the Great and Spacious Building. If I lower myself, when I say lower, I'm talking about taking on the burdens of others, mourning with those that mourn, doing what Christ did, right? We talk about the condescension of God, where he lowered himself below all of us, which is doing what? It's love that is doing that. That's the opposite. Lowering yourself below others, and the other is puffing yourself up. And so when we understand those two things, the Tower of Babel and the Great and Spacious Building is the opposite of the doctrine of Christ. That's a very key point to understand what what the doctrine of Christ means and how it is, knowing, understanding that the doctrine of Christ is the opposite of pride helps us understand how important the doctrine of Christ is. And understanding how important humility is, how important love is, right? The love of God is. Those are opposites. We'll get into that in another episode very shortly here. He goes on and talks about the former CIA analyst, Martin Gurry, who predicted that these fracturing effects would happen in his 2014 book, The Revolt of the Public. He analyzed, um, he focused on the authority subverting effects of information's exponential growth. So again, it's like it's like it's like the fruit from the, t- the, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's like you need the knowledge. We all want the knowledge, but we don't handle it very well and some of us don't handle it well at all. We lose faith. We lose trust. Again, trust is faith. So when we talk about the whole it's not just losing trust in in, in institutions. It's losing faith. That includes with the church, the brethren, and yes, it can also mean that you start losing trust and faith in Christ. That's the same thing. It's the same animal here that we're dealing with. 
a lowering overall across the board of trust. He says that Guri could already, Height says that Guri could already see the power of social media as a universal solvent. I dealt with solvent uh, a lot in auto body, I remember, uh, auto body and auto shop in high school. A lot of places don't even offer that anymore. But uh, that it was breaking down the bonds and weakening institutions everywhere it reached. He noted that dis- distributed networks can protest and overthrow, but never govern. He described the nihilism of the many protest mov- movements of 2011 that was like Occupy Wall Street, that were organized mostly online, and they demanded the destruction of existing institutions. This is what happened with uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. They, were, they, they wanted to, the elimination of the police, right? No more police. Break down the institutions, and then they, in, they, they do it under the name of racism. And they have the added benefit of, of social media to help them you know, be the solvent that disintegrates the bonds of democracy. Guri goes on to say, I'm showing this, uh, these these images are taken out of the, uh, they're snapshots of the, of the images in the, in the article. So if you're listening on the audible version here, there's a woman here looking into a shattered mirror, a broken mirror. And at the center of the broken mirror is the, the thumbs up like, in there. But he says the following, the digital revolution has shattered the mirror and now the public inhabits those broken pieces of glass. So the public isn't one thing. It's highly fragmented and it's basically mutually hostile. It's mostly people yelling at each other and living in bubbles of one sort or another. Now, before ending the article with some things that can be done, where he's looking for some reform in social media, and he does an awful lot of work on this. He's a, he's a great reference for this. If you haven't seen Jonathan Haidt speak or listen to him speak, I, I recommend that you search for him on your podcast platform or on, on YouTube and listen to him speak. Read what he has written. He is someone I wish the church uh, pulled from. In, in learning more about millennials and Gen Z especially and their reactions to trust in, in everything, you know, including the church, right? This is, and parents and other things. It's, it's, it's important to understand the psychology behind uh, social media, how it affects these kids dramatically, especially the kids, um, all the way up through, through co- being college students. And, and then it, it, tends to, for many people, decrease in, in, a, in, in what it, how it affects people. But then, you know, people that are of the older generations, they, they didn't have this growing up. But he talks about how it's going to get much worse. He says that artificial intelligence is close to enabling the limitless spread of highly believable disinformation. The AI program GPT-3 is is already so good that you can give it a topic and a tone, and it will spit out as many essays as you like, typically with perfect grammar and a surprising level of coherence. Fake stuff. In a year or two, when the program is upgraded to GPT-4, it will become far more capable. He talks about how factions of uh, within America are not going to be the only ones producing this information. It, it, that, that is this, this anti-truth posts and information and essays, but it's going to be our enemies also outside of the U.S. So you've got those domestic and foreign, right, that, that are going to be producing a lot of fake information. And it's on both sides of the spectrum. And it's, it's within each side of the spectrum. We, we, we're going to see, I believe it's true, as we talk about the ites and how, if you look at uh, also the Book of Mormon uh, coming up to the, before the visit of the Savior in the Americas, you see that everybody had gathered in and become one. They even had a fortress around them as they tried to fight off the Gadianton robbers and then beat them. And then they end up, you know, during that time also, they're, they're breaking out into smaller groups 
into their seven tribes and beyond. And it's the same thing. They're breaking out into ites. And then he says this about the mission of, of the United States and democracy. He says, in the 20th century, America's shared identity as the country leading the fight to make the world safe for democracy was a strong force that helped keep the culture and the polity together. In the 21st century, America's tech companies have rewired the world and created products that now appear to be corrosive to democracy obstacles to shared understanding, and destroyers of the modern tower. Again, he's using the tower as if it was a positive thing. I don't think that, in in that sense, the, the, the tower is not exactly what he thinks it is. To me, the tower is the internet itself that causes the the fractioning. And then finally, he finishes off offering three suggestions to fix things. Number one, harden democratic institutions so that they can withstand chronic anger and mistrust. I I I don't know if I've got enough trust to say that that's the best thing to do. I think that you have to do things that are going to gain the trust of individuals. Second, reform social media. That's one that really has to happen so that it becomes less socially corrosive and and better prepare the next generation for democratic citizenship in this new age. Okay, well, those all seem to be important in one way or the other. I don't know about the hardening of the institutions or what he exactly means by that. But uh, uh, he does go on and talk a little bit about it. I, I, I think it requires trust, and, and it, the trust is what has to be built on this um, from the individuals. It, it can't just be a hardening of the institutions as if that, that just seems to me that that's going to offer a lot more uh, mistrust with individuals. But Jonathan Haidt really does have his ear to the ground on all of this. He takes the temperature very well with what is happening. I I highly recommend that you read him. Read especially The Coddling of the American Mind, put out in 2018. Very, very good book. Very interesting. It will really open your eyes. If you have kids and uh, that have already gone, that, that are coming up through you know junior high and high school uh, if you have kids that are in college if you have kids that are uh, you know in their mid-20s late 20s especially I, I think that this is going to help you understand some things if if you read this this is what we the church needs to understand what's happening with this mistrust because it's it's it, the the trust issue is a big part of what is happening with the church and the loss of many of the millennials and Gen Z in the church. So I wish that we had a little more uh, feedback from someone like a Jonathan Haidt in, in understanding the dynamics specific to the church and, and the, the membership in the church. Appreciate your time. I'll finish with this. There is a lot of mistrust happening, and it's happening within the church too. Um, the gospel is true. The church is true. And we are going to have to ride through more fractioning and more disintegration, more deconstruction and critiquing, especially from academia and from those that are pushing critical social justice. We're going to have to go through the ride. And, and, and we've got to be careful about the levels of trust that we have overall, broadly. But that's not just an overall you know, everything is high or everything is low with our trust levels. Um, We need faith in the Savior. That's trust. We need faith in the brethren. That's trust. We need faith in the doctrines of the church. And that is going to be the exact opposite of what appears to be a society that is headed toward a... uh, draining of our levels of trust. Thanks for listening.